Okay, uh, this video is in response to Conference Report's uh, recent video on the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, there are two things that Fred says that really interest me. The first has to do with his uh, general sense of frustration about talking and thinking about consciousness. If I understand him, he seems to be implying that the hard problem is hard, if for no other reason because consciousness somewhat defies words, language, and is so inarticulable. The other comment he makes is this one. We've got this thing called the brain, and it's incredibly complex. We know that. It's got all these connections, but even beyond the kind of connectivity of it, it's incredibly complex. There seems to be some kind of, possibly have some kind of quantum computing going on in there. This idea that the brain and its neurons somehow compute or perform computations has always baffled me. Fred is by no means the first person to use this term in conjunction with the brain. People also talk about the brain acting like a computer and individual neurons performing computations. I wonder, what exactly are they supposed to be computing or calculating? Are they setting up equations and solving them? Are they performing literal acts of multiplication and addition somewhere in their microtubules, calculating integrals and derivatives? And do they use the base 10? Or are they more advanced using digital technology? And what do they do with the numerical answers once they've been calculated? To me, this is uh, more evidence of Fred's contention about consciousness being baffling and impervious to even thinking about it. In this video, I want to do two things. First, see if I can try to better define or narrow the definition of consciousness vis-a-vis -vis the hard problem. Second, using this more focused definition, try to explain how I believe the brain produces consciousness in a way that doesn't entail computations and is far more organic. It's more analog as opposed to digital. My approach doesn't rely on fuzzy concepts like neural computations or quantum voodoo, and it does so in a way that actually employs Occam's razor. One way to define consciousness, or the way I'm going to choose to do it here, is to say that it's a succession of sensory experiences, or using the parlance of cognitive scientists, a succession of qualia. Here's a quick list of examples. I should also state that, in general, all of these qualia come in two versions, live and remembered. This remembered realm is less articulable and nowhere near as vibrant as the real or live versions, but I think if you were asked to, say, conjure up a memory or an internal mental image of the color green, you'd be able to do so. In a typical situation, in typical consciousness, there's a countless number of qualia. For example, imagine you're walking down a busy city sidewalk on the street, a car rolls by you, slams on the brakes, someone rolls down the window and hollers something at you. There's visual qualia, auditory qualia, and possibly even emotional qualia all occurring during this brief scene. I now want to propose how I believe the brain produces consciousness. And to make it as simple as possible, instead of focusing on a full-blown stream of multimodal, multisensory qualia, let's just focus on the generation of a single quale. So, imagine you're floating in a sensory deprivation chamber. There's no sounds, no light, nothing touching your skin except the high-density salt water at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And at a certain time, a robotic arm silently positions a small sprig of fresh mint leaves just beneath your nose. And suddenly, you experience a single sensation, the smell of mint. So this is the quale, the snapshot of conscious experience I want to talk about. At this specific moment, this is what I believe is happening in our brains. But first, a little background. Our sensing systems can generally be described as follows. They consist of three main contributors. Sensing neurons, transmitting neurons, and for lack of a better term, reporting neurons. These reporting neurons happen to occur in sensory maps. These maps occur in three general areas, the brainstem, the midbrain, and the cortex. For the sake of this discussion, we'll assume that when we experience the smell of mint leaves, it's triggered by the presence of mint odorant molecules in our nasal passages, but ultimately because of the activity of the neurons in one of the midbrain maps. Generally, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the stimulation of a particular sensing neuron and the stimulation of a specific group of neurons in these maps. That is, instead of just a single reporting neuron becoming stimulated, there's a column or a barrel of neurons, which might consist of anywhere from 100 to tens of thousands of neurons, all in close proximity, as seen in these diagrams. OK, so when our quality of mint odor occurs, there's corresponding activity in one of these columns. So what is this activity? 
firing neurons. Some fire more than others. Many of these neurons feed back into the column and sustain the activity. Others try to inhibit it. Others branch out to other maps. And what exactly do we mean by fire? Basically, the neuron shuttles an area of electrical charge down its axon. Now, we know that when electrons move in a conductor, they create or induce a magnetic field. We also know that when the strength or direction of a magnetic field changes in the presence of a conductor, it induces the electrons within that conductor to move. It happens that our bodies and brains are, to a large degree, saline solution, a good conductor of electricity. When all of these hundreds or thousands of neurons fire at their own unique frequencies and in a very confined area, the electrical activity of one neuron induces magnetic field changes in neighboring neurons, which in turn affects their electrical activity. And this induced electrical activity then creates its own magnetic field effects, which in turn meld with and affect other neighboring neurons, etc., etc., etc. Seen this way, this entire active column of firing neurons could be viewed as a complex qualianic oscillator or qualianic resonator each column in the map creating its own unique dynamic electromagnetic signature, each column consisting of a physical scaffold of neurons permeated or infused with this less physical, diaphanous, ethereal, intangible, invisible EM activity. And this complex amalgamation of EM activity, I contend, is what constitutes our first person quale. In other words, the EM activity is the selfsame thing as our quale. Now, I think there are two ways to look at this. One is from the outside in. You can imagine having some kind of high-tech, futuristic, non-invasive brain probe that's able to make thousands of measurements within this tiny column measuring instantaneous voltages and magnetic field parameters. Some would call this looking at it objectively. However, we could also consider it from the inside. We could envision this EM activity as having a type of emergent wholeness the entire summation of activity being a type of dynamic, four-dimensional, elastomeric EM substance, having a unique internal quality that defies, escapes, or transcends our measuring instruments, but has its own expressed essence, a qualianic essence. This would be looking at it subjectively. In essence, this EM activity is the causal end of the road. It is the quale. Now, earlier I mentioned Occam's razor. Like Conference Reports mentions in his video, the idea of consciousness is challenging to discuss and articulate. Consequently, some people seem to take the approach that the only way to explain something so non-intuitive and mystically transcendent as consciousness, the only way to counter it is by using something equally as non-intuitive, spooky, and mystical, i.e. quantum mechanics and quantum computations. Interestingly, in people's rush to embrace an explanation that leverages quantum voodoo, they've mysteriously bypassed the electromagnetic paradigm. I believe this EM paradigm has two major advantages. First, compared to the billiard balls of classical Newtonian physics, EM activity is still very non-intuitive. However, it's far more familiar and common than quantum behavior. Even though we can't physically empathize with EM activity, we do, in fact, employ it every day in our modern technological environments. Everything from cell phones to vacuum cleaners to CAT scanners to electric guitars is founded upon a basic understanding and application of electromagnetic principles. Secondly, if we're looking for a cosmic flavor in our understanding of consciousness, something with a pinch of spirituality or mystical spookiness, EM has as much to offer as anything in the quantum voodoo domain. Electromagnetism is the stuff of interstellar winds, solar flares, the aurora borealis, and lightning. EM activity permeates our galaxy, our planet, and our brains. It's ubiquitous in our universe. So, from the perspective of Mr. Occam, of favoring the explanation that's the least complicated, I contend there's no need to invoke quantum voodoo, when the EM paradigm is much simpler and much more straightforward. When it comes to consciousness and qualia, the resonating EM fabric found amongst our neural columns is the stuff of conscious experience. However, there is no metaphysical Cartesian haver of these sensations, of these experiences. All there is at the moment of experience is the experience. In essence, you are the experience and the experience is you. EM activity, cosmic winds, 
lightning bolts, and firing neurons. Thou art that. Thanks for watching. I'm looking forward to your comments.